Okay, um, we have just a, a little bit of uh, lecture for to finish, <coughs> for to finish out, and, and then we're going to go on into uh, chapter five and actually pretty much get through it today. I think um, what's going to happen. So uh, next Tuesday is a week before uh, the first quiz, and usually I stop the material on that day at some point. So. At some point on, on uh, Tuesday, I'll draw like a red line saying material quiz one stops here, quiz two stop, starts after this. And so I'll let you know on Tuesday where that point is. We'll, we probably won't be able to get all the way through uh, control of gene transcription, which is what we're getting into today, uh, but we'll get, we'll get pretty close. And so I'll let you know. I'll, I'll probably also post the um, uh, practice exams for quiz one. And also, Tuesday, uh, I, this weekend, actually, I'll, I'll be posting your group assignments and the floor plan, and it's a tight one. So uh, you have to really pay attention to where you're going to sit. Tuesday, we will sit with groups, and, and you really do need to bring your clicker on that day. Okay. So we've had, like, five lectures, so, and you've known from the first day that you needed the clicker. So I, I really need to get those clickers and so that... Uh, so Bailey, I don't have to go through a list of handwritten names every time. Okay, any questions? Good, okay, so um, we were talking about components of uh, the protein matrix that makes up the, uh, boy, the thing to turn on. Okay, it's gonna take a, a minute for that to, to warm up. So there's, um, we talked about one protein component of that matrix, which is topoisomerase 2. Uh, a couple of other really important proteins that actually form that shape that chromosomes assume uh, during mitosis are, the first one would be condensins. And condensins are, as the name suggests, and I'll be able to show you here a figure in a moment, they're sort of like a little bracelet that loops through the chromosomes and um, makes them condense into a, a higher order of folding uh, a packing arrangement. So those condensins are incredibly important in getting the, the chromosomes to, to uh, condense, and they are actually turned on um, during the, the first phase of my, uh, mitosis, and, which is prophase. And so you get these, let's take a look at, so these are condensins and what they look like. So they're, they, they reside in that part of the, of the cell, uh, of the nucleus, okay, wherever this uh, chromosomes territory is. And remember, chromosomal territory is basically where the chromosomal DNA likes to be when it's not activated. It really needs to loop out of its, it generally loops out of its territory into a transcriptionally active area to turn on. So there's a lot of looping going on back and forth uh, in the nucleus. So it's a very dynamic place. So there's topoisomerase and uh, so Really, we need some other uh, mechanisms to take these things and, and loop them even tighter. And so one of the machines that does it is this is a condenser, okay? Um, so uh, these SMC subunits make up the condenser, and we'll probably, we're not gonna worry too much about the, the details of its structure, but it's a heterodimer. And um, there's sort of a hinge and then um, an ATP binding domain that actually gives it some mobility to go in and grab DNA and link it, okay? And so what you can do is, obviously like a, like a, a bracelet, you can put different kinds of things. It's more like a car, car key ring. You can put lots of keys on a single ring. And so you use this to actually string together the DNA into higher order uh, structure. So you can get, this is sort of the, the car ring thing. And then you can link car rings to car rings and you bring the DNA even tighter and then you start to stack those multiple rings on top of one another, and pretty soon it becomes obvious how you can get this really tight packing. Now, we're not going to go into the exact details. A lot of those details are not known, but this protein is absolutely essential in causing that condensation of the chromosomes in prophase. And actually, you'll learn through the cell cycle, there's a, a particular uh, phosphorylation of this ring structure that has to occur before it becomes active. So it's actually told when to condense the chromosome. One, once it's going, when this thing is condensing chromosomes, there's no way it's going to release it. It's going to, it, it will actually have to go and be um, 
pulled into a new cell before that, that grip that it's got on those um, uh, pieces of DNA are actually released. Okay. Um, another another uh, <coughs> linker um, of, that just shows you if you um, were concerned about where it actually is in that little the structure of the nucleus. So this is where that particular chromosome is. And just notice that the condensins, when they're fluorescently labeled, uh, just light up the backbone of what's going to be that mitotic chromosome. So they're actually responsible for um, uh, forming those. Okay, so the other, so the third protein, yes? The uh, condensins, is that what wraps up the solenoids? Is that what? The condensins, is that what wraps up the solenoids? No, actually the loop domains form before uh, that, that actually, uh, taking a solenoid and, and bringing it into a more thickly folded loop domain comes first. And then the condensins uh, further condense the loops and pack it into a, a mitotic chromosome. Okay, so the third player here uh, is uh, basically these um, uh, little rings here, the uh, cohesins. They're responsible for linking the sister chromatids together, okay? Uh, during uh, uh, mitosis, and basically you have to actually release those in order to get the two chromosomes to, to pull apart. So that's a, a critical uh, checkpoint in the cell cycle is to break those uh, cohesins apart, allow the, chromo the chromosomes to segregate into new daughter cells. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, though, it's what's holding the, the duplicated chromosomes together. And so again, it, it's there in the... Um, as one of the matrix components that, that forms the backbone to which all this DNA is organized. So there's a lot of uh, important structural uh, components. <laughs> all right, so we have this model of, of uh, loops that can loop out, but once you get into the mitotic stage, you've, you've committed to uh, turning off all transcription. Um, one of the, the places in the nucleus that shows whether that um, cell is actively uh, trans, transcribing and translating uh, proteins is in the nu nu nucleolus. The size of the nucleolus is directly proportional to the activity of the cell. How many proteins it's pumping out is determined by this structure. So you have these fibrils and you have these little granules. And the fibrils are actually the um, DNA from five different chromosomes. Let's see if I have those. Yeah, there you go. So there's uh, it's 13, 14, 15, and there's no reason to memorize these numbers but there's 21 and 22, have a region that is just highly amplified uh, DNA that codes for ribosomal RNA. <coughs> and so all of these components, these are called NORs, uh, nu nuclear organizing regions. And all the NORs end up associating together in this region called the nucleolus. And so that's what makes the nucleolus where it is. It's the, the DNA from those five chromosomes get together and what goes on there is it turns on a transcription of ribosomal RNA. And so you know that ribosomes have two components. They have ribosomal RNA and they have ribosomal protein subunits. What you see here, these little granules, those are the ribosomal large and small subunits that are actually constructed inside the nucleus. Because you've got the, the RNA right there, so you might as well just put it together with the protein. And then these individual subunits they're too large to go out as a big snowman, which is a, a ribosome. So you sort of chop the snowman in half, and you have that large and, and small ribosomal subunits that exit through the nuclear pore. And then they reassemble um, on messenger RNA that's, that's uh, being transcribed or translated. Okay, But this is where all ribosomes are being constructed in the nucleolus um, in the cell. So the, really, the take-home message from all of this is that the nucleus is a very organized place. It's a very complicated place, but there's not, it's not just willy-nilly. Things are there in a particular region for a particular uh, function. Okay? All right, so that level of uh, control over gene expression really brings us into the next segment. And um, one of the... There's two reasons that you took genetics. You probably didn't even know this, but that's so that you could come, you will have covered chapter five in this book and then chapter six. We're not going to do that. You're supposed to have covered, you're supposed to know this, how the translation works on the ribosome, those really fundamental elements of genetics. What is the structure of a gene? Uh, you're supposed to know that, how transcription works 
uh, what the components of messenger RNA, how is it spliced. Those are basic details that you should have picked up from genetics. Now, some of you may have not taken genetics in a while. Some of you may take it last semester, but you've already forgotten it. So if you need a review, I've actually um, posted um, the PowerPoints and outlines that I used to cover. I used to do this, but we just don't have time to, to recover things that you should already know. But if you want a refresher, then go back to the, the file folder in the lecture materials for lecture five, and I have background material. This is the background material for lectures basically five and six, and the rest of uh, gene expression. So if you're a little rusty on, on the details, so for example, let's uh, look at the... So here's the background outline. So if you've forgotten the, the conventions for naming um, nucleic acids, you've forgotten uh, what a promoter is, you've forgotten what a general transcription factor is and in which order they bind. What's the first one that binds the promoter? <coughs> they all have the same start name, TF2. What's that stand for? Transcription factor for RNA pole 2. Okay. So the first one that actually recognizes the, the promoter is TF2D because it's got a tata box a binding protein. And then that's going to recruit TF2 uh, uh, A and B and uh, F and E, they're out of order actually, and H, and they all come together and they form what's called the pre-initiation complex. If you don't remember that, that's fine, but this is your outline and then you can look at the outline and you can look at the PowerPoint and go over that very quickly because we're just going to use that vocabulary as we go through today's lecture and beyond. And so I just wanted to give you a chance to, to know where that backup material is. Otherwise, you're going to have to read all of Chapter 5 and all of, actually, Chapter 6 is more important than Chapter 5 because Chapter 5 is just plain straight genetics. Okay? It's a review. Um, so you need to know the information in this outline. Okay? And we'll use it. All right, so that brings us to back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so where we are in Chapter 7, that's the control of gene expression. So our, our job is to go, if you've got the basics under your belt, let's use those basic tools to understand um, how you can actually cause different cells to appear. Okay? That's one thing we want to be able to do. If you know how to control um, gene expression, you, you can explain how a neuron ends up looking like this as opposed to a lymphocyte that looks like that. That's wildly different. Um, shapes and functions, that's all caused by differential gene expression at some level or another. The other thing we, the reason we want to be uh, interested in this is because um, it also makes a lot of difference in medicine. So this is a, a DNA microarray and what it is is uh, arrayed across the top going from left to right are uh, about a hundred and I think it's 147 different uh, tumor uh, tumor cell lines that that are taken from particular tumors. So there's there's several from prostate, several from lung. That that one's unknown. And then brain, renal, ovarian, breast, and liver. Okay, so there's multiple cell lines that are made for each of these tumors. And so they're they're looking for uh, common expression patterns patterns of of uh, messenger RNA in each of those tumor types so we can figure out why they're so screwed up in that particular type of cancer. Okay, and what you, so the way to read this, so these are the, the different cell lines, okay, so the columns are different cell lines, and the, what are the rows? There's uh, 1,800 genes are arrayed going from top to bottom. Each one of these uh, rows is a different gene, okay, and they're all, they represent the most commonly expressed uh, genes that might be affected by cancer, right? And so if you see um, a green line, what that means is that the expression of that gene by the tumor cell is lower than a normal cell. So it's actually suppressed, uh, that, su that expression is actually suppressed. And if you see a red line, that means its expression is higher than a normal cell. So we're, tumors can progress for, for uh, three different reasons. One, they actually have mutated genes, mutated genes, and that usually there's five or six key mutations that cause cause cancer. 
Uh, SARS is one of them. We talked about that protein, uh, but there's many others. But mutations aren't the whole story. Part of the problem with a cancer cell is its incorrect pattern of expression. So everywhere, let's look at prostate cancer. Every, let's see this big blotch of, of green. It means all of those, all of those um, uh, DNA transcripts are being underexpressed. So what, what a, uh, a tumor likes to do is it likes to underexpress what are called tumor suppressors. That is, your body has a normal control process that suppresses the formation of tumors. What the tumor does is it suppresses the expression of the suppressor. Okay. Now, the second type of, of protein that tumors are interested in uh, are those that are called oncogenes. That is, if you overexpress them, they cause cancer. They cause the cell to migrate, they cause blood vessels to form to feed the tumor, they cause cells to divide faster. All of those are called oncogenes. Those are the ones that are in red. So, but notice, for different types of cancer, you get wildly different expression patterns. So let's compare prostate cancer to breast cancer. So in prostate, oh, and where, the, where there's a black, a black line, that means that the expression is very normal in both the tumor and the normal cell. So that means there's no, it's neither over or underexpressed, and so it's less important to us, all right? So you see these are all suppressed in prostate tumors. In breast, there's very, so there's, they're either not expressed or they're overexpressed. And that makes a lot of sense because the types of proteins that are in breast uh, tissue are very different than the kinds that are in prostate tumor. Uh, prostate tumors are driven by androgens. What drives breast tumors? Estrogens and progesterone. So uh, it's a whole different uh, ballgame. So if you look up here uh, in the breast tissue, these genes are all overexpressed, but they're underexpressed in brain tissue. And then they're not expressed at all in a prostate um, tumor. So, <laughs> It's a real, what we can do now though, is you, you, you can take a patient and have an unknown here and just line it up and it will fit one of these expression patterns and we can tell where that tumor originated. And also more importantly, we can begin to zero in on exactly the different proteins that need to either be upregulated or downregulated using drugs, okay? Targeted chemotherapy. So this is an important issue in both development and how cells work and in medicine. That's why we, we put our time in understanding this. Okay, so we've, we've completed most of these learning goals um, we've, uh, uh, last time, and so we only have one of these left for the, the lecture five slows. That's to describe the elements responsible for differential gene transcription. And let's uh, briefly remind ourselves of some of the, the real basics that you can get from Okay. So the reason that you want to go back and look at that uh, chapter six outline is to refresh your memory. So if I, I write a sequence, just A, T, just anything, A, G, G, C, what do you know from that? What are the conventions that you assume uh, for that DNA sequence? What does it mean? Which strand is it from? By convention, I should have only write one strand, because you can write the other one, right? If you, it's not a problem, right? So which strand do you write? The coding strand, okay? And unfortunately, different people, I, is that what, they, in, in your genetics class, is that what they call, do they just call it? So it has the term coding strand. It's also uh, the scent strand. And it's also the uh, non-template strand. Because it's not that this is the strand, and remember, and what is this end down here? Five prime. Five prime. Okay. And this is three prime. Okay. And so you could you could write the you could write the sense the uh, anti sense strand the template the template strand that you would write here is the one that's uh, actually read three to five, going that direction by pole two. Pole two doesn't read doesn't read the coding strand. They call it a coding strand because it has the same sequence as uh, messenger RNA, except for U and T inversion, right? Okay, so these are the little conventions that you need to refresh your memory about. Because I'm just I, when I write a sequence, I 
assume that you know that's what this means. Okay. And if we get off on the wrong foot, you're going to be completely confused. So uh, I would say go back and look carefully at that material before you really uh, study today's lecture. Okay, so what level of, of control are we at now? We've, we've just finished a pretty uh, lengthy part on a part that's not even up here. Epigenetics is, you could call that minus one. The, the DNA actually has to unfold before you can transcribe it. It has to display control elements because those contro DNA control elements are what the, the proteins, the transcription factors, are looking for to, as landing strips. Okay. So now we're at this level. This is what we want to uh, focus on. And um, so we need to understand what are con genetic control elements, how are they arrayed. Um, and so this is a, a typical anatomy. I like this. It's not from your book, unfortunately, but it's a really nice, concise, a little uh, messenger RNA gene. And that's the only type of gene transcription we're going to worry about in this class. If you want to go deeper into uh, transcription of, of of uh, transfer RNA, or ribosomal RNA, or microRNAs, then you need to take cell two. But we're, our focus is here, okay? So here's the start site. This is the RNA, this is where the RNA coding region starts, and it runs this way. And it stops with the poly A site, all right? And uh, going in the negative direction are all, these are all control elements. Now, the control elements are where transcription factors bind. That's, that's a really good term. The word element usually means DNA sequence. Okay? So it's a control element. I'm not talking about the transcription factor, which is a protein that binds to it. I'm talking about the landing strip where that protein touches down. All right? So a typical promoter is where the general transcription factors assemble. Right? You have the machinery that every single messenger RNA gene must assemble in order to transcribe a gene. Okay. That occurs at the promoter, and tip, here's a typical promoter. is usually a combination of two or three things. One is a Tata box, about 25 base pairs upstream from the start site. Also, an initiator sequence. It usually is an adenine, okay? And it's always located within exon 1. What else is in exon 1? The 5' prime untranslated leader sequence is also there. That's not going to be turned into... Uh, into to protein or to messenger RNA, but it is, I mean, it is going to be turned to messenger RNA, but not protein, but it's, it's control information. Um, the, and by the same token, the exon three, exons always start and you always end with an exon, all right? And the, the last exon always contains the three prime untranslated region. It's also not part of the protein coding sequence. Okay, so the promoter is, is generally the title box there, and sometimes there's a BRE, that's a TF2B uh, response element. Uh, it's like the, the second or third general transcription fa factor that sits down. And so all of these guys are assembling up here at the promoter. The more stable you can make that assemblage of GTFs, general transcription factors, the higher the rate of transcription. That's the, the biggest take home message. Anything that stabilizes their assembly, and I'll show you what it looks like, that's what it looks like when they're all assembled, right? This is the promoter and all the general transcription factors are all ready to go. The only thing that has to happen, and so it can actually start reading the template strand, which is the antisense strand or the non-coding strand. So remember that multiple vocabulary, all right? So it can start reading. So it does a couple of nucleotides. And then TF2H, which is a kinase, <laughs> is one of the, GF, the, the general transcription factors, actually phosphorylates this C-terminal domain of coal 2 and just loads it up with phosphate groups. That's like a kickstart on a motorcycle. It just goes like that. You go into the elongation phase. This thing shoots down the template strand. Uh, it's, uh, it's being unwound as you go forward, and you're, you're reading that, that, that um, antisense strand, the non-coding strand, and coming off of that will be a new uh, messenger RNA transcript. Okay, but to, so we're, we need to step back and what is it, the, uh, what kind of things will stabilize or destabilize this group of G GTFs? That's really the question. That's where the control elements and their binding partners come into it. 
Okay? So that's what we have to answer. Okay. Um, before we get into the, the details of, of binding, let's go back to our little anatomy and pick up some terms. And probably the best way to do this, well, let's, let's do a couple here, and um, then we'll go to the outline to get some details. All the details are on the outline. But So there's the promoter. Uh, if you have a sequence that's within about minus 100 or minus 200, it's considered to be a control element that's promoter proximal. Hence the term promoter proximal control elements. And they're usually short sequences, like this so-called cat box. Why are they called boxes, by the way? Anybody know? That's the sequence that the, the transcription factor binds to. It's the consensus sequence. And so poor schmuck went around looking for all these consistency. <laughs> and if you drew a box around it often enough, it became, oh, that's the cat box. That's the sequence, it's always there. So you just draw a little box. It's, it's, the, it's the footprint where the protein's gonna, gonna sit down. Protein's a helicopter, that's the landing strip, okay? And so that's why they're short, is because only one part of that protein is gonna sit and touch the DNA. To be a transcription factor, whether you're a general or a specific, a specific transcription factor is one that's found only driving the transcription of a particular gene, not all genes, okay? And so what they're looking for are those, those little consensus sequences, and they're going to touch down. So this is a, a cat box, a, a GC box. Those are classic promoter <coughs> proximal elements. Okay? They're not part of the promoter. They're usually upstream. They're always upstream. Now, they're very rigid in where they can be. You can't take a, a cat box and move it up or down a few base pairs. In other words, in the laboratory, we can play these games all day long. We can move it and flip it and do all sorts of stuff. If you move this very much at all, it becomes non-functional because it has a very intimate relationship with the promoter because look what's going to happen. Some sort of gene regulatory protein is going to flip over and like get this right there. See, there it is. This is before it flips, and it's going to stabilize the structure of the GTF's assembly for the pre-initiation complex. So the, the location is very important. You can't mess with the location of a promoter proximal element. Okay? But different, different um, control elements, you can. So let's take the example. So in other words, you can't move it, and you can't flip it. You cannot invert the sequence. Now, let's take a different type of element that is stimulatory to transcription. It's called an enhancer. These are, again, short sequences. But the cool thing about enhancers is that they can be 50,000 base pairs that direction. They can be inside of an intron. They can be all over the map. They can, be, they can even be way down here, way past the gene. They can actually be on a different chromosome. So these are proteins that attach to those are, have mobility to really flip over, so they can be way out here, but notice how the DNA flips over and uh, allows the proteins to communicate with the general transcription factor. That's what an enhancer will do. Okay. So their location is not really hugely specific. It could be, you know, 45,000 base pairs away, or it could be 40, or it could be, you know, 30,000. It doesn't matter. You can move them around. They're still good at what they do. Um, are there some restrictions? Absolutely. But the other cool thing about uh, an enhancer sequence, as opposed to this guy here, which are proximal elements, is you can flip them. You can actually reverse the sequence, and that footprint is just as valuable as the forward footprint. Okay? But you can't do that for a proximal. These are much more uh, set in their ways, if you want to make that analogy. Okay. So now we, we've talked about we talked about uh, enhancers. Uh, what type of transcription factor? Now let's talk about the proteins. Okay. What binds to an enhancer? An activator. <coughs> activator refers to a protein, okay. not the DNA control element. So an enhancer is a DNA control element. A activator is a protein transcription factor. And we will dissect the anatomy of a classic, a several different classic uh, transcription factors because. If they sit on the DNA, they have to be able to bind to and recognize nucleotide sequences, and we need to understand how that happens. Okay? Good. Um, 
What about uh, if there's activators or there are things that turn DNA transcription off? Obviously. What are those types of DNA control elements called? <coughs> Pardon me? Suppressor? So, no, that's close. They got the sort of halfway in. So we're talking about the D, DNA. It's a silencer. Silencer refers to a negative DNA control element. Silencer. What's the protein called? The transcription, all transcription factors are not positive. Half of them are negative. What are the negative ones called? Repressor. So the repressor is a protein. Silencer is, is its footprint on the DNA. Okay, so keep DNA and the protein names separate. They have separate terminology. And these are all written down in the, your outline for, for chapter five. Okay. Uh, so we talked about silencers, activators, repressors. Uh, so now let's go forward and see how these guys actually read the DNA. All right. Got two choices, pretty much. You can, you can either read the minor groove or the major groove. So this is the minor groove. Put your hand in there. You, it's sort of a diagonal. It goes this way. So you're looking at how small that is. That's smaller than the major. See that gap? Just look at that little triangle, that, little, that white space. That little triangle right there is much smaller than that big triangle. That's the major and minor group. Most transcription factors bind to the major group. That's a good rule. Why is that the case? Well, I'll show you. Um, if you read, if you look at uh, and these, even though we write the sequences of cat boxes and, and enhancers with a single strand, understand that the protein is reading both base pairs and the sequence of base pairs. It's not reading one base pair, typically. It's reading a sequence of base pairs. Okay, and so, so here's the display. If you're looking from above, you see this surface. If you're looking from the minor groove, you see this surface. Okay, so this is a GC pair and this is a CG pair. We don't want those to be the same look, do we? That's, that's two different sequences, right? You have to be able to distinguish between whether it's a G or C in the sequence, right? If they look the same, you're screwed, right? All right, so what, does it look that way? If you look from the major groove, you get a different set of binding partners for each one of these base pairs. So for a CG pair, you get a hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond acceptor, you have a hydrogen bond donor, and then a hydrogen and then a hydrogen atom. Okay? So that's what you would see. If you look at and so if you look at a CG pair, which is a different sequence, you get a hydrogen atom, you get the reverse. You get a hydrogen atom, the hydrogen bond donor, and two hydrogen bond acceptors. It's very different, isn't it? So if you look through the ma major groove, you get a different look for every base pair possible. If you look at it from underneath, like you go back here, and you're looking at it from under here, you're coming in from the minor groove, it's not different between GC is the same thing as CG. That's, you're messed up, because you can't tell the difference between those two sequences. Now, are there some proteins that actually bind there? Absolutely. The most famous one is the Tata box binding protein that's part of TF2D. It binds in the minor groove, and when a transcription factor binds in the minor groove, it tends to make the DNA turn into a scissor. It, it actually changes, it forms a little crotch there. It makes the DNA bend, and then all kinds of proteins can fit in there and talk to one another. So that little bending of DNA is a, is a really important part of a general transcription factor action. But we don't want that for the specific transcription factor. We want them to be able to read precise sequences. And we can only do that from the major group. Okay, is that clear? What do we mean? Okay, and so look at the, the sequences. These are the eukaryotic and the, the primitive animals. And as you go down, what do you notice about the length of the sequences? They're, they're getting smaller, right? So you think, boy, you'd think that the humans, you know, as smart as we are, we have this really amazing, complex little stretch. But it's just the opposite. The bacteria have a huge sequence where the lac repressor protein sits down, right? What's our trick? The way we 
increase the complexity of the binding specificity is to combine lots of little guys together. Instead of using one or two sequences, we have many sequences. And so it's, again, it's combinatorial mathematics that allows large combinations of very similar sequences to define a specific gene location or specific gene control. All right, so it's the unique combination of transcription factors that turns a uh, mammalian gene on, not one single transcription factor. So what we're looking for is a unique combination of proteins that coalesces around this GTA, uh, this pre-initiation complex. All right, so there's this binding side is going to be different from that one, from that one, from that one, from that one. Okay. So they're short. Uh, each one of these is, play, is where a protein sits down in the DNA. They must have a DNA binding motif okay, to be able to bind. So here we have a DNA binding protein. It's coming in, surprise, from the major groove. This asparagine residue, and if this were a test, you would be, you know, I'm, one time I, for test question, I just blocked out that word, and I said, what is this residue? You have to be able to understand, know the R groups and say, that's asparagine. You know, if it didn't have that amide, it would be aspartic acid. But this is asparagine, and it is um, picking up a hydrogen bond from this hydrogen bond donor, and this is a hydrogen bond acceptor, okay? And so it's making two little handshakes with this nucleotide. Okay. So um, let's now talk about um, classic DNA binding <laughs> proteins and what their motifs look like. So now we're, we're going to use our, our protein vocabulary that we developed in the previous lectures to do that after the break. Okay, let's go ahead and get started again. <clears throat> So our first, um, we're going to look at a very limited number of transcription factors. These will be our poster of children that will help reinforce the concept of what a transcription factor is. And basically the, the first big concept is that there is a DNA binding motif, which is usually tucked inside of the DNA binding domain. Okay. And there may be more, one or more of those. And then that's connected by a flexible loop or a piece of protein to an activation domain. Okay, so those two are independent <coughs> domains. They're independently folded, and they're very flexible. So the, the footprint, the, the DNA binding motif, can bind into and recognize the specific gene that it's supposed to talk to. And then the activational domain is going to interact with protein-to-protein -protein interaction. That activational domain talks to other proteins, not to DNA. But to be a transcription factor, you have to directly touch DNA, or you're not called a transcription factor. You can be a cofactor, a coactivator, or a co-repressor, but if you touch DNA, then you're a transcription factor. Okay, so let's go and look and see how this first one, homeotic genes, there's a really common, uh, the motif, DNA binding motif is helix turned helix, and these are genes that regulate uh, development. Uh, they're about 60 base pairs, let's see. Get the uh, diagram up. There we go. Okay. We looked at this on day one. <clears throat> and so the actual helix turn helix is um, helix two. There's a short turn. That's not a beta term because these are not beta strands. Okay. And so it can't, it's just a turn because it's short. Okay. I think it's actually about three amino acids. And that connects two, you can actually see a little bit better, connects it to three. That's the, you've taken a different look and sliced it like a, a sausage, but so that it's two, turn, two, three. Three is what we call the recognition helix. It's the one that's thrust into the major group, and it's doing the job of reading those base pairs, not, not one, usually just one of the nucleotides, but several base pairs, okay? And this one, the third one actually plays a role by actually putting its little foot down on the minor group, and so that's a little odd, but that's the way this family of transcription factors works. Okay. And so it's going to, uh, what's missing? What part? This is the DNA binding motif. What's missing? Remember, two pieces, two components? The catalytic domain? Well, it's not catalytic, it's a protein-protein domain. <coughs> it's, it's called by various names, unfortunately. But activational, transactivational domain, and that would be located on a different part of the protein, we can see what that looks like. 
There. So this is a specific one. I think this is, so a homeotic genes are genes that control development. They actually control body plans. We can be more specific. In everything from Drosophila all the way up to us. Okay. Um, and so here's the DNA binding motif, and here's the, the two. This is two. The one that's inserted is right there, so that would be three. There's the, the little, yeah. It's this one. This is two, and that's the turn, and then that's three. And so that's the one, this is the recognition helix going like that. What's all this going? That's the transactivational or the transcriptional activation domain. So, hence, we usually call it the activation domain. And so it's a different part of the independently folded protein. It looks very different, right? And so it's going to talk to other, it's going to recruit other proteins to come bind to it and assemble some sort of group of proteins that, that stabilizes the general transcription factors assemblage into a pre-initiation complex at the promoter. Okay. Now, in us, um, we have Hox, what is it, Hox uh, 6C. The word Hox means that it's one of these guys. And actually, we, we know how these uh, really uh, mess with body plan because the, the Drosophila genetics, they, they can do things that we, we're not allowed to do. For example, they can take, so this is a normal fly, it's pretty weird, but anyway, it is, okay. And then if you mess with the Hox genes, uh, it, you duplicate them, you get a, a, a mutation called bithorax. It just duplicates the body plan, so you have two thorax, thor, thoraxes, thor, thoraxi, I don't know, whatever. But um, you get two sets of wings. Well, it's not going to really move, huh? Or maybe he's too heavy to move, I don't know. And if you replace the position of the homeotic genes, you can get feet growing out of the antenna. So this is uh, the antennapedia uh, mutation. So this controls body plan, and it does so in us. So that Hox, um, Hox C6 uh, actually determines where our arms sprout out from our, our, our trunk. The, the highest, uh, most anterior expression of that gene determines where it stops. That's where your arms come out of your, as an embryo. Okay? And so Hox genes control body plan there, and it controls body plan in our cells. All right, but if the, the DNA binding motif is a helix, turn helix. Okay, the second uh, poster child are going to be zinc finger uh, DNA binding motifs. And uh, a zinc finger, is, the name suggests, is uh, organized by a zinc atom. Not an ion, an atom. And it coordinates four different residues. You have two choices. You can have two cysteines, or you can have two histidines. But there's got to be four different residues coordinated by that bound to that zinc atom. We call this a C2H2 zinc finger because it's got two cysteines and two H's. That's trivial. Right? But it, it puts it into a different class. Um, what, it, what it does is, here's the motif that it actually forms. It's a two-stranded beta sheet, very short, that's very closely, the edge of the sheet is stuck on to an alpha helix. What do you, if there's only one alpha helix, and this is the DNA binding domain, what are you going to do with that helix? <coughs> Put it on top of your head, behind your back, into the major groove, into the minor groove, into the major groove. Okay, good. Glad we're all on the same page. So um, you can have multiple DNA binding motifs in a single protein. So this one has three different zinc fingers. They all do the same thing. These are all positively charged. Uh, the histidine's a bit iffy, but they both recognize uh, GC uh, pairs. GC pairs. GC, GC, GC. Okay. Now, what's a medically related uh, example that you'll be able to remember? Steroid hormones activate steroid receptors, right? So a steroid hormone like cortisol that comes out of your adrenal gland, the steroid. Uh, that's a hormone. It goes to a target cell like your liver. A liver cell has cortisol receptors. Um, and the cortisol receptor is a zinc finger ligand activated transcription factor. So it's a ligand activated transcription. All steroid receptors, estrogen receptors, androgen receptors, they're floating around most of them are floating around in the cytosol, waiting for a bat binding partner. If they're active all the time, we would all be in a big mess, okay? 
we're waiting for the steroid to be secreted to tell us when to activate that transcription factor. When the transcription, when the uh, hormone binds to the receptor, and this is a good, this is the cortisol receptor. Um, the cortisol receptor binds to cortisol, and then it dimerizes, and it goes into the nuclear core, and it knows that it's going to hunt for its uh, hormone response element. There's that word, element, so you know that means it's looking for a piece of DNA. We call uh, hormone receptors uh, binding to their elements, is those are called hormone response elements, because they're the piece of DNA that are responsible for responding to that hormone, which is cortisol. Cortisol without the receptor doesn't do anything, does nothing. It activates as a ligand the receptor, which translocates into the nucleus and binds right to your DNA. It's, there's, it's a really direct signal transduction pathway. Okay, so no, so there, it dimerizes, and it's so it's two identical pieces, but they're not set up like this. They're not in tandem. They're set up facing one another. So notice, so what we got here, you have two zinc ions. How many zinc fingers does each subunit have? This is a subunit, that's a subunit. I said it was a dimer, right? How many zinc fingers does each one have? Two. Count the zinc ions, atoms. Okay, one, two. And notice, the C terminus for this guy is pointing that direction. The C terminus for that guy is pointing the other direction, correct? Okay, so they face, they face fist to fist like that. And they're looking, they're binding to an identical sequence here. And then there's a, a, a spacer because this is, these two zinc fingers are involved in dimerization. So zinc fingers can do two things, right? They can dimerize the steroid receptor and they can also project a recognition helix that identifies the hormone response element so it knows where to sit. And it's, what's really cool is that this sequence here uh, is exactly the same as this one, except it's inverted. Does that make sense? You invert it because they're facing one another. So let's see if I have a good example of... Uh, this one... Mm, let's try this. Five. Back now. So I'll show you, I'll turn you, I'll show you how to, to make a, a steroid hormone binding element. Um, where is it? I had a sequence picked out. Maybe it's not there. Um, it's 3C. Oh, here we go. Yeah. All right. So you can take this as a good example. Uh, this is not a hormone response element, but you can make one. So if I just gave you this sequence right here, A, D, A, T, T, C, 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 C. Um, let's say that's the footprint for this guy sitting like that. Then there's a little spacer you could put N, 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 because it could be any kind of nucleotide. We just want the space because that allows all the protein to get in there, okay? It's the overhang between those two dimers. You would take that, and that's what this is. This is inverted of that. You can take that sequence and stick it up right next to there. So you go N, 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 and then start with this sequence, G, G, C, C, T, T, A, A. That's the invert repeat of this thing. But you put it on to the same sequence. So that sequence is A, A, T, T, C, C, G, G, in, 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 okay, and then G, C, 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 T, T, A, A. That's because those guys sit facing together. It's exactly the same sequence, but they're facing invert repeat. It's also called a palindromic sequence, okay, because these things would fold up in base pair. All right, that, that's a lot more detail, but I wanted to show you that there is a structural meaning to that sequence. It's where a protein puts its foot. All right, let's go back to these guys. Okay, the um, where does the hormone bind? So if we strung this out from N terminus to C terminus, the way you would diagnose, let's, let's do that. I go into a lot more 
detail, obviously, in endocrinology, but we can do a, a basic thing, because I want to show you the components. So if you just drew a, a hormone receptor, it's a lot easier to look at it this way, N-terminus, C-terminus. What's right in the middle, that's the DNA binding domain. That's where the zinc finger is, one of the zinc fingers. Okay, the, towards the C-terminus, this is the hormone binding dom domain. That's where cortisol binds to the cortisol receptor. That's where estrogen binds to the estrogen receptor. That's where androgen binds to the androgen receptor. Do they recognize different footprints? Absolutely. Right? Or sometimes they actually represent, they, they uh, recognize the same sequence, but the number of nucleotides that's, that are spacers is different. So you can actually, if you change that spacer, you can convert an androgen binding sequence to a vitamin D binding sequence. Vitamin D also uses the same technique. Okay, so DNA binding, what's left, what have we left out? Transcription factors must have what? DNA binding motif. What's the rest of the protein do? Activation domain. Activation domain. And that is always located in the C-terminus or steroid receptor. So this guy is going to beckon to other binding partners, co-activators. Sometimes steroid receptors turn act as repressors. And that could be a repressor. That could be a silencer. Okay. Because cortisol is turning some genes on to raise your blood glucose, and it's turning some things off, like silencing insulin, to keep your blood glucose high so that you can run around and be stressed. Okay. Activation domain. Okay. Questions about that yet? Okay, so we can do useful things with these motifs. Uh, okay, so here's the deal. Why do, there's several reasons why transcription factors tend to be uh, dimers. And one of those things is to increase the number of binding partners, and so you can increase your repertoire of footprints that you're looking for. Okay? And let's let's take another one. The helix loop, helix motif is a really important one. And so if you dimerize, you can look for this sequence, look, this blue sequence, we can assume is the same uh, in all these different uh, situations. So this means some specific sequence. And of course, you can homodimerize, and it's going to look at, say, six nucleotides of the same sequence in two different places. And it's going to, it, this actually uh, is a leucine zipper because it has a um, coiled coil domain, all right? And it has two recognition helices, right? Now, uh, just changing the different uh, proteins. So this could be one protein. This could be FOS. There's a protein called CFOS. And this could be C June. It, so those words are C. C stands for cellular, because when they're mutated, they become oncogenic. So C June, J U N. C June is this one. And C FOS is this one over here. C F O S. C dash FOS. Okay? Now, look, you can heterodimerize, and you can increase the number of footprints that you're looking for. Now you're not looking for a blue or a red, you're looking for a blue and a red. Increase, so dimerization gives you a larger repertoire of footprints to the human body. Okay. And so, is that all the, I thought I had a better picture. No, there we go. So this is a hip, um, typical uh, leucine zipper. It's got a dimerization motif, just like the, um, the zinc finger had a zinc finger that was involved in dimerization. This one has an alpha helix. And the reason we call this a leucine zipper is that every seven amino acids repeats. Guess what is at residue one and four of every seven amino acids? Leucine. Why? Why? Put a hydrophobic residue there. Oh, you just thinking. I do that too. Um, River? Yeah. If you have two of those locations up the entire alpha helix, then um, 
it'll, it, since it's hypertrophic, it'll be avoid water and it'll bind and tilt out there out the helix. That's where that helix, that's a, a actually more elegant way of saying they touch each other at residues one and four. And so that's where the water is going to be pushed out, so you need to put a hydrophobic residue. And this one solves that problem by using the same one over and over and over, loosing, loosing, loosing every one and four. So every seven amino acids repeats, and every one and four position is loosing. And that's where these two guys, they don't look like they're touching, but they actually are. Okay. And so these things zip together, loosing zipper. Okay, and then it's got to have a recognition helix to complete the DNA binding motif, and it's just a single, I mean, it's two helices, right? But this dimer, <coughs> the point, if it's C-June and C-FOS, it has a particular name. It's called AP1, transcription factor. It's a very common one. It's expressed in cells that undergo cell division, <coughs> and unfortunately, in lots of tumor cells. Okay. Okay. Um, the last uh, little poster child that we're going to look at is this one. And this is fairly similar, but it's so it looks like it's got four different alpha helices. But the, really, the, the um, each individual protein is called a helix loop helix instead of a helix turn helix or some other name. So it's got, uh, basically looks like a, somebody with big ears staring at you. So you've got a helix, and then you've got a loop, and then you have the two recognition helices that are projecting into the major groove. Um, a good example of this is a protein called MyoD, M-Y-O dash capital D. This is involved in muscle development. So when that gene is expressed, uh, what it does is it forms a very, you call this motif, it's got two names, it's got two names. The first name for a DNA binding motif is helix loop helix. But it's also called, uh, by a motif that I've already told you about, a four helix bundle. This is a four helix bundle. That's why it's so stable. Okay. And that's important because uh, when this uh, muscle cell precursor is developing, there's a particular order in which these things have to be have to turn on in order to turn that thing into a muscle cell. And the first one that commits it to the muscle cell line is my OD. Good. Okay, where does that bring us to? Fingers, helix on helix. Okay. So, why are, again, are there any other reasons why these things tend to be uh, dimers? One, it increases the, um, the complexity of the interactions by having multiple combinations of different types of monomers. So, you can have June, June, FOS, FOS, or June plus FOS, and they're looking for different footprints, right? Okay, so that's that idea. It also increases the, the specificity of interaction because instead of looking for um, six nucleotides, you're looking for 12 because you touch it in two different places. So that makes, uh, it's very specific to look for, the, the longer stretch of DNA that you look for, the more likely is it's not going to occur by chance. If it's a real short sequence, it could just occur by chance just because of randomness. But this is, if you make a longer sequence, and so instead of being a, a, a six uh, residue or six uh, nucleotide footprint, you have two of them. That makes it a 12 residue sequence that has to be there in order for that transcription factor to do its work. So it increases the specificity. And finally, it's just a matter of strength. Two, guys, two arms binding on the DNA are more strong than one. And it's got to stay there long enough to do what? to stabilize the general transcription factors assemblage into a pre-initiation complex. So the more stable this thing is, the more strongly it stimulates transcription. Okay. Is that it? Okay, so now let's go back to the a few surprises left on the PowerPoint. 
actually before, yeah, okay. So the other thing you can do is you can really get creative if, if you have dimers because, and here this is <coughs> increasing its binding repertoire. You can actually, um, this is a helix, uh, loop helix homodimer, and some genes uh, actually code for a cripple that binds to it. So it has, it's purposely synthesizing a repressor that is, when it binds to one of these helix loop helixes, it prevents it from binding to DNA. So one way of repressing a transcription factor is to synthesize a crippled transcription factor. And this is actually happens in nature all the time. It's particularly true with thyroid hormones. Is the cell will express a form of that protein that can't possibly bind DNA. And so what it does is it goes and it sucks up it can still dimerize, right? So it sucks up all the good transcription factor and eliminates its ability to turn on genes. That's the good way to turn a gene off. These things are so powerful, you do not want to, would you want to leave the, the glucocorticoid genes on all the time? No, your blood glucose would go through the roof. Well, it happens a lot of times, unfortunately. But this is a good way of turning it off. You make a negative protein that, that actually blocks the action of uh, the heterodimer. Lots of diversity, sequence diversity. Okay, and just to sort of stretch our, our understanding of uh, how valuable the different domains are and different proteins, let's look. This is a, um, a protein um, that has, it's a transcription factor because it's got a, a DNA binding protein and it's got a activation domains. They're independently folded and uh, they do their jobs independently. This one binds the DNA without ever bothering the activation domain. So what it does is when it binds, it actually st stimulates the Tata box assemblage at the promoter of the general transcription factors, and it stimulates the, the um, synthesis of this galactokinase gene, which it, you don't need to know this, but it converts galactose to glucose. Okay, wonderful. Now, what we can do, we can do an, a little experiment. We can take a bacterial protein. This is the normal bacterial protein. It has a binding, uh, it has a, a DNA binding motif. Uh, it's got its own activational domain. But what we can do is we can play a trick and we can, we can uh, create a new protein that has the Lex A <laughs> DNA binding domain, but it's got the GAL4 activation domain. Okay. Now, if you throw that into this, so you've got two genes and we've got, uh, what we've done is we've taken the normal protein coding region off and we've put something there that will let us know when the genes turn on or off. That's called a reporter gene. Sometimes, say like that galactokinase, it's too hard to assay that. So we'll actually stick a new gene on there that makes uh, a protein uh, that's easy to identify. That's what the LACZ gene is. It's a reporter gene. See, it doesn't really matter what's downstream from the start site. It's going to make whatever protein that is, as long as this guy is activated. Okay? So, this chimera, if you put it in there and you have these two different genes, which one would it turn on? It actually, uh, the activational domain is still functional whether you put it on a bacterial protein or not. It's still, it, that's why it's, it's very independent. And that hinge allows it to have that independence. All it has to do is come over here and stabilize the general transcription factor. But it's actually going to bind to um, the sequence that expresses that Lex A binding site. So when you make a chimera, um, the gene that turns on is not determined by the activational domain, it's determined by the DNA binding sequence. So you can imagine a problem where you, know, you have a hormone receptor and, and something else over here. What, what happens is, the, the activational domain, the function remains similar. What determines which gene turns on is which DNA binding domain you put together with the other protein. Okay, so that's what this is intended to, to show. Okay, uh, let's just very quickly do, uh, get out your clickers. And I'm not actually taking, so if you, if you didn't bring it for the last time. This is the last time it's acceptable not to have your clickers. Okay. Um, but let's go. Okay. I'm 
contact this guy. Let's see if I can get that a bit bigger. Okay, whoa, 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 you don't even know what the question is. <laughs> Start over. Okay, not, don't do anything yet. You, I, I'm going to put this, what this thing does is it actually takes a screenshot of the, of the page, and so I know exactly where, where it is. And this is five answers. Okay, so do this number three. I'm sorry, 41. Ten seconds. I can actually activate the clock, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, everybody's answered. Okay. Let's see if I can click on it. Okay. Uh, so this is a pretty firm belief that it's C. Oops, sorry. Get this back up. C. And that is the correct answer. Okay. So this kind of, this is a low level type of question. This is a vocabulary. If you're in class you should, and you study this, you should know this. This is not a thinking question. Those are higher order questions. So we're going to have a mixture of those on the exam. Let's, let's do the next one. You don't need to use your clickers. It's just code writers are most likely to bind which part of the nucleus. It requires a little bit more thinking. Census. Well, what does a code writer do? What's the characteristic of a code writer? It, what is its protein functionality? What kind of category would you put it in? Is it a structural protein or somebody said what? Yeah, it's an enzyme, right? And so it's going to write something, a mark or remove a mark from the histone code. Where's the histone code written? On the N terminal tail. That's where it's written. It's not written in the histone fold. A mediator is a protein that brings general transcription factors to the promoter. That's not out the door. Uh, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. So uh, it's not B and C because uh, B, that's the histone fold and it's not the mediator, so it's the answer there is in terminal Okay? Alright, we'll we'll finish there.